all that in there, but whatever. We're good. All right, we're good. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Community Arts of Bellevue's Live from the View uh, this evening. I hope you have, uh, I hope you've rested up. You're going to need all your energy to get through this one tonight. It's going to be a great show. Uh, I'm super, super excited to have our guest with us tonight, Mr. Herb Williams. Uh, let me just say that um, I have I have been a friend and have admired this artist for at least 20 years. Um, we go back many moons, uh, back to some old work that we did back at the Oasis Center. Wow. Uh, we do a lot of collaborating with our kids at the center, and uh, I've admired him ever since. So I'm super excited to be uh, on this show with him tonight. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a background, I mean, Herb was born in Montgomery, Alabama, from the Deep South, um, and worked in, usually worked in, in uh, the construction business, I think, throughout most of your summers, throughout high school. So we, uh, Herb is probably one of the only individuals in the entire world that actually has an account with Crayola Crayon Company, um, and for good reason. So... Uh, Herb also, uh, he holds the world records with Ripley's and Guinness on his uh, sculptures. His sculptures have also been placed in hospitals, corporate lobbies, museums, even the White House. Um, Herb received his BFA in sculpture from Birmingham Southern College and apprenticed under uh, other professional sculptors. And then uh, immediately went into a work at a bronze foundry. I never knew that. That was new information to me. Uh, before moving to Nashville, where he, resumed, resu where he received the Joan Mitchell Foundation Museum Purchase Grant. You know, Joan Mitchell's like one of my most favorite icon artists of all freaking time. So I'm, ugh. the next star artist award and was sponsored by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts in 2011. Uh, through all of this, uh, herb sculptures have garnered and reached as far as China, England, Canada, Belgium, Germany, Australia, Croatia, Japan, United States, um, you name it, his sculptures have traveled there and probably even has added to the list since then. Herb, we're really delighted to have you with us tonight. We're super, super excited about your uh, show and what we're going to learn from you this evening. And um, I'm going to kind of hand it over to you. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Bellevue. Uh, go back and forth from there and East Nashville and especially downtown Nashville for the past 25 years, um, you know, being in a, a native, I guess, after after 25 years, you could say you're almost native, you know, but um, I've, I've seen a lot happen in this city and it's it's been exciting. Um, welcome to my new studio. I've just moved into a repurposed shipping container. There's uh, actually three of them all welded together in this place called uh, the Blocks in one city, over off Charlotte, uh, west, not really west Nashville, it's close to downtown, right across the street from the off the wall murals. I'm sure y'all have all driven by, and it's really inspiring. There's this little oasis happening outside, like, here, Michael B, take the phone off the, the thing. I'm not sure if y'all can see it tonight, but they've got the volleyball, sand volleyball court lit up, and there's teams actually playing in October, you know, um, and it's it's a uh, it's like a little oasis in the middle of you know this repurposed shipping container uh, haven. So where there's a uh, vegan ice cream next door, there's Avo restaurant, and it's it's nice. They're very intentional. There's a lot of green uh, energy happening, and so uh, I consolidated a lot from my bigger studio downtown. But the uh, the landlord just sold the building as. It, as an artist, you got to get used to gentrifying a place and then having it sell for a lot more than you could ever afford to stay at. You know, that is our lot in life. And so um, I'm in a new place, but I'm really excited because uh, you, you get to make your own rules in your own studio. And this this wall here is one of my favorite things. Michael B., my, my assistant, helped me kind of figure out a new system. And these are cases of of individual crayons by a case of about 3,000 uh, each. I, I, you know, call Crayola and they send me my, you know, whatever color I need. And this is uh, lavender right here, you can see. And we, we paint the, the boxes so that it, it makes sense to me. Like this circle represents a whole crayon. The square 
means that I've cut just the, the tip off. So it's the butt of the crayon that I'm looking at. The, the triangles, like this down here on the red, means that we've cut the butt off and it's just the tip. So it's, it's a great way for me to look at about 200,000 crayons and know exactly what I can use and what I can pull to, to create a real sculpture on the fly. Um, this is one of my, my sculptures here of the, uh, you know, the, the world map here of, of tonight, you know, of our states being divided both red and blue. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful y'all are tuning in to here and not the debate because it's hope you get a little more sanity, you know, in here. But um, you see where the, the tips and the butts uh, to where I cut my crayons down and use them uh, in, in such a way that, that it's really satisfying texturally. You know, um, working on some paintings here that I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, this is the back part of the studio where uh, I've got a really nice, let's see, I've got my framing and I'll cut down woods and panels over here. More crayon storage here. This is an essential tool wall that, man, I, I love to have an organized tool wall. You see where I'll paint exactly what needs, like I know I measuring tape belongs here, my level here. So I can have over interns and assistants and help me out because a lot of the stuff I'll make is so big. I really, I, it, I sometimes have trouble moving it myself. So it's nice to, to keep things organized. You know, I've got some storage in the back. Um, it's, it's really, it's a really cool space and it's air conditioned. I've got air filters happening in here. So I'm not too worried about getting the COVID <laughs> thankfully, um, you know, but I try to keep my circle real tight and nice and I haven't allowed anybody, but a couple of people who I, I make, you know, them test weekly. So it's, it's nice and safe and I'm, I'm pretty happy. But, um, let's see, I think out here, I wonder if there's anything else to show you. Uh, goodness, How about these cool boom boxes? Oh yeah. Yeah. These are uh, a couple of, uh, fun, you know, boom boxes from, I'm a child of the eighties and, I love like having kids in, and I'm like, yeah, this is when they, they made radios that you had to carry on your shoulder. Uh, but it it kind of defines, I think, uh, children of our age, you know. But uh, workstation. Yeah. You see where I, I'll cut down some of the tips. I've got tens of thousands of them to where uh, you see just just the tips alone. Where these are all robin's egg blue, and I'll use them for certain pieces. But uh, you know, after I've, I've carved a, a form down or something, but I try to keep it organized so I can easily get to it um, pretty quickly. But I, I've got a nice uh, presentation just uh, put together that's got uh, kind of a history of, or it can briefly, you know, I, I speak better through, I think, symbols and images rather than uh, you know, telling you about my, my stuff. And, and this will be something quick we can we can show you like in a like a PowerPoint almost that I've, I've done for a couple of different museums and I, I put together a cool one for y'all. So Glenn, do you have that or do you got any questions before I get into that? I, I, I did have a question and it's completely got away from me, um, which is uh, I expected you to open those boxes and see little orange Crayola boxes inside of there, the, the 64 packs. But uh, so what, what do you usually use to cut your crayons with? How does, what is your, what Great is that? Question. Like? Hold on. I've got something out. Yeah, right here. All right. Great question. These are oversized dog toenail clippers <laughs> and they are, uh, it's not what I immediately started with for the first, you know, uh, six months. I was using um, like a, an exacto blade and I would roll them and cut them all by hand. And I mean, oh, it just, it, eventually I would have uh, like a pizza party and buy some beer and invite my friends over and we'd all cut crayons around the dining room table. And one girl came over who was a dog, like trimmer, you know, she was a dog groomer and she pulled a pair of these out of her purse. And she's like, have you ever seen these? And, and <laughs> man it was like she hung the moon and she was the virgin mary all at the same time because i heard <laughs> angels singing you know it was it had changed my life uh ergonomically it's it's so nice when you can 
realize like, oh, wow, I'll be able to live into at least my 50s before, be, you know, getting carpal tunnel. I don't know. So this is this is really satisfying, um, you know, because it's fun to kind of invent your own wheelhouse. And, you know, when you're you're in your own studio, your own rules apply and you need just the right tool for the job. And who knew it's got to be the oversized dogs, though, for the uh, the tool, the tiny ones stone right. can't get anywhere. I'll drink to the oversized dogs. All exactly. Day. Yeah. So here, I'm going to pull the slides up for you. Oh, great. great. Here, I'll stand over here. You want to stand over here? Sure. You know, so you do a little about how you do the paintings and then... And then I will. I'm going to get into that okay. at the cool. end of it. Uh, I've got a whole run of show. All right. That's the first image. Uh, that was me as a goodness. Right out of college, I got a job down at a bronze foundry in West Palm Beach where uh, I learned from Luis Montoya... And he had a, um, a foundry that he called Poplitio, which was a Spanish group that uh, it meant like elbow. I think it meant nothing, you know, and uh, but we made gorgeous, big bronze fruit and vegetables. And that sculpture I'm standing with, we cast the last sculpture that photorealist Dwayne Hansen made before he died of cancer from, you know, all the fiberglass that he had used as a young man. But that piece is in the Whitney museum you know and i got to to cast it it's in six different parts we had to weld together and then we delivered it to this tiny little japanese hyper realist painter in miami for him to paint it but the funniest part of that sculpture uh you see my buddies greg and beto we're all standing around him um is after he was painted and he looks photorealistic his hand uh, is holding a diet coke and he's this 300 pound guy you know on a riding lawnmower um, so it's it's just a timeless, humorous, great piece, one of my favorites. But it uh, it really showed me kind of what you you can do as an artist um, and the scope of things. It really opened my eyes of like uh, what can happen in a museum. You know, it's totally different than than what can happen in in a gallery or you know a show out at uh, you know a craft festival or things. Sure. So it's it's a uh, it's cool to, to play to, you know, the audience you really want, you know, and that's what I'm, I'm always aspiring to play to this audience in my head rather than, you know, where we are or where you are. But anyway, I know almost all of us are living in our head anyway. You know? <laughs> no choice. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, that's a, a sculpture out of limestone and steel. Um, when I first started making sculpture, I was really into the idea of balancing all things, uh, finding, you know, man's place in this urban world, you know, how can we find a good balance? And um, one of my heroes is this, this Japanese sculptor who has a, a garden in New York, Isamu Noguchi. And you've probably heard of him because he designed this coffee table that's real minimal and strange but he's done amazingly gorgeous, giant stone and gorgeous minimal sculptures out of wood. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to see his museum in Japan, look him up. It's, it's, it's so moving, you know, when you see a giant sculpture in the flesh rather than just a picture of it. So that's what I started to aspire to by carving these, but they take forever. So I realized I had to do something else or I would never become prolific enough to, you know, make a living because that took me months to carve just a piece of stone. It's just ridiculous. It's kind of like the time that I decided I was going to become a Sherry Warner Hunter and do these massive mosaic pieces. Yeah, that didn't last very long. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you have to have assistance, you know. Have you seen that movie on... Rodin's assistant, uh, Camille Claudel, you know, uh, there's a beautiful scene in it where she goes to Rodin's studio and it pans out and shows just dozens of students working in his giant warehouse, all carving and sculpting a different sculpture that Rodin, if they're lucky, he would go and sign his name to. He would never even touch it. Like, and that was the ultimate, uh, you know, good job. Good job, boy. You know, way to go, son. 
uh, you know, and let me sign this for you. Uh, that, that, that times have changed, you know, and you've got to pay people what they're worth. But to be a sculptor, you really have to have incredible assistance if you ever want to in this break a break the the ceiling, you know, uh, yeah. break out. It's it's so incredibly tough. It's big work. We learned it the hard way. Yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, that's an early piece I cast in bronze. Uh, my father died when I was pretty young in a sawmill accident. So the saw is just a big symbol. And then I became a carpenter. Uh, it's got purple heart wood for the stripes. But I've always been a big fan of Jasper Johns and his iconic use of the flag, of just looking at, at things we all see, you know, every day. But, uh, you know, how does that define us? Uh, you know, and it's still worth like seeing people waving the flag today, tonight at Belmont and how that's, um, you know, what does that mean now compared to when people put it out for 9-11? You know, it's it's uh, it's something worth revisiting all the time as an artist. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be an American artist? Those are questions so relevant to all of us, you know, and I'm still I'm still finding new new questions and new new reasons to really explore that. Yeah, I like this piece a lot. I'm a Jasper Johns fan as well. Yeah. Oh, he's so brilliant. He's still alive, man, in his 90s up in yep. Connecticut, I think. Still man, producing, still painting, still creating. I know. That's what I want to be. I want to be an artist like who's still in my 90s, you know, having ideas. And I tape a stick to my arm or I can tell somebody to make what I want. You know, that's I love that. It's all about ideas up in here that can keep you young into your 90s. I mean, I mean, come on! It wasn't long ago we had a banana duct tape to a wall. True. Yeah. Lots of on. Here, you covering the speaker with your finger. Here. Oh, okay. I can't hear him. Yeah, here you go. I got. It. All right. Oh, that's a that's a, a piece I did when I was pretty young. Of uh, I cast my own legs. Um, those are my uncle's boots and. I, I've been listening to Beck, um, just an amazing musician, and he was talking about his uncle, who uh, I'd never heard of, and he said, my uncle is a visual artist, and he inspired me to do what I do. And so I looked up his uncle, and his uncle was this kind of strange dude who defined his art as fluxism, which um, is the coolest word I'd ever heard. I, I want to be a fluxist. Um, it's it's I love how they they treat their art and the whole idea of creating something that appeals to more than one of the senses. Usually, it's pretty humorous. It's it's usually taking the art world and pointing, you know, kind of fun at it, uh, trying to to not take yourself quite so seriously. And I, I think the art world could really use a lot of that. So I made this coffee table with my, you know, knobby knees. It, it's ridiculous, but a lot of fun. I love it. It's got Herb Williams written all over it. It just does. Yeah, just take, you know, what, you, what else are you going to do with a pair of old pants that <laughs> you can't fit in anymore, but they have paint all over them? What are you going to do? I mean, it's, I love it. I love I, it. I've got, I got a lot of clothes that have paint all over it. All right, that's one of the pieces. This got me the, the Joan Mitchell Award. I was doing three-dimensional uh, uh, paintings of uh, mostly downtown and areas. The, the ironic thing about this piece, I did this painting several years before we even opened up the Reimer Gallery where I curate at, and it's the view from the front door looking through the arcade. And, um, you know, I used the, the city skyline kind of popping up around it. I, I took real creative license with grabbing my favorite buildings and you know um i just thought it was ridiculous but i love uh red grooms a lot and his sense of humor so i was trying to to take things that we all see every day and um show kind of the the everyday humor in like the there was always one fat motorcycle cop on a scooter who would would you know swing by and i, I loved it you know now they're all on bicycles or horses and stuff but they for a brief moment in time we had these tiny little scooters and really really big guys on them and it was it was too good i had to put him in there
And then, uh, goodness, that that's the first piece I created out of crayons. It's when I really discovered the whole, um, I guess my, my style, you know, if you want to call it that, just the using the crayons as sculpture. Um, a friend of mine had moved to New York and right after 9-11 was asked to donate some works of art for a, uh, a charity to raise money for the victims and for even some of the firefighters, you know, who've lost their, their lives. And uh, I'd never even been to New York. This was early 2002. And uh, I took a lot of time trying to think, you know, what, how could I make anything about this event that kind of defined, gosh, our time. Maybe it's one of the most defining events of our time. And to treat it sincerely and to be honest. And I, I just started noticing that everyone would put, you know, the flag in their window or on their bumper sticker or on their door or mailbox. And it meant something for this brief moment in time until, you know, we went to war. But it was really, it was inspiring to see. And it, it made me question, you know, what does it mean to be an American? And I thought um, about how would, how would you just how would you tell your child about this event? And so I tried to make something out of what children would use so they could relate to it. And, you know, of course they'd use crayons. So I just started getting as many crayons as I could. And so I bought a lot of 64 boxes and started cutting them down. And man, it, it's really expensive because it's like $10 a box. And it doesn't get you very far because you've got to buy how many boxes to get that many blue and white crayons. It was nuts. So it took me a little while. Um, but eventually I bought so many, you know, that um, I, I, I figure out new tricks. And eventually Crayola called me and, and said, you know, what are you doing? You know, you realize you, you qualify as a wholesaler as much money as you've, you've spent uh, here. So that, that kind of changed my my whole pattern and my whole life. It was ridiculous. I'm sure that would have to like change your whole, your whole aesthetic to be able to do what you could do. Yeah. That's your, that's uniquely yours. It's what now? I said it was, it would change the whole landscape. Yeah. So you it, can, you can really do the work that you were meant to do. Thank you. Yeah, man. It, you know, getting enough of your, your product for, you know, it, it changes everything when you can think on the scale that you want to create. And I, I do like to think big and dream big. Even if I'm making something small, I want to think as big as I can about it. You know? <laughs> sure. Moving to the next slide. And so that kind of opened the door. This was a, a piece I made probably five years later. This is in 2005. And one of my favorite artists is an artist named Sandy Scogland. She is incredible. You should look her up. She's an installation artist who sets up entire rooms that she'll sculpt and paint and then put figures in them and sell the photograph and have the installation in a museum. You know, so you can see it. Uh, one of her most famous is a kitchen, a green, you know, a, a, just a gray kitchen with a couple at a table and dozens of radioactive green cats running around the room so gave me this idea to to take my art as you know and one step further so i created a stage where the walls and the floor were thousands of blue crayons and i used half inch loose sight on the floor to distribute your weight and you walk in and play the blues and i did an opening at the arts company on fifth avenue and invited everybody and told them to all wear blue so that we could you know, get a picture of you, I'd, I'd take a Polaroid out and shoot them, you know, play in the blues on stage and, and sign the print and give it to them. And it was so much fun, man. I, uh, I need to do something like that again, because it, it, uh, it allowed the viewer to experience it, you know, as opposed to just seeing something, you're taking part in it. And I, I love that. Um, art should be more experiential, you know, when it can. And it, it's so satisfying. But uh, thankfully, some music exec from California was in town for CAA, or back, back then it was called the Fan Fest or something, and the CMAs. And he, uh, he, bought, 
he decided he needed it in uh, L.A. And so we we drove it out there and uh, delivered it and installed it to him. And it, it was so wonderful that it happened because I had sunk every dime I'd ever made into making this thing. So that if I didn't sell it, I would probably be in hiding down in Mexico right now for, you know, just debt I'd incurred. Because that's it's something like a quarter of a million crayons we put in there. It's nuts. My God. Well, it's awesome. <laughs> that is so freaking cool. Isn't it satisfying? And I just asked a few of my friends. Actually, Sam Dunson is in another photo of that. He's one of my good friends. We're doing an art show of his right now. But he was the bassist. And uh, he showed up late for the photo shoot. So I had to stand in um, until he got there. But uh, Ted Jones uh, is a fantastic local artist. He used to teach at TSU. And is a great uh, woodcut artist and that, that's him playing the saxophone it's just ah. it's cool yeah i was proud of it it's cool that is very cool there was a project very similar to that that you were working on with the kids that they always just stuck because i remember the great big huge mis musical instruments and stuff and oh yeah that's that's it man they helped me um cut crayons for this project and everything for and i would go and teach and volunteer there and you know and in turn they would they would help me uh, you know carve or paint or do something you know behind the scenes man yep. yeah yep. that's a great that's a great organization how cato how yeah i love yeah. how he's the best and if i'm not mistaken back then debbie hupp was running the learning center ah. and uh, i just happened to walk in the day that y'all were all working i just i just sit there and watched for hours dude it's ridiculous and you know and then I love doing stuff like that because you tell people about what you're doing and they just look at you like, what? But then when they see it and they see the final product, then they're like, oh, you are crazy. You know, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll participate. That's crazy, but fun, you know? You're certifiable. That's yes. that's what we're all looking for in life. Certifiable I mean, crazy. Most, most of the greatest artists, they are in one way or another out of their gourd. You know, in, in hopefully the best way, though. Hopefully. Hopefully. We can grab another one. Let's go for it. Um, there's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's a commission for, uh, goodness, Chancellor Gee at Vanderbilt. And he wanted, you know, the, the man in black. So we sculpted up a six and a half foot tall Johnny Cash out of fiberglass. And that's like, that's what 150,000 black crayons look like, man put wheels underneath him because it was so heavy you could not move him without wheels man he was so heavy oh but um it's so funny they put that in their dining room and would bring um you know prospective students and have dinners there and he was in like this beautiful red and gold ornate very formal uh dining room you know and there's johnny cash and uh <laughs> i think he liked you know making people uh question things you know it's a pretty funny guy that's amazing that's amazing how many black crayons did you say oh about one hundred and fifty thousand. good gosh yeah yeah man some sometime we'll have to go out for a drink and i will tell you like you ever work on a piece for so long and you're just exhausted you start to dream about it yes i know johnny cash oh, yeah. visited me in one of my dreams man and um We'll have to have a drink, and I'll tell you what he said, because it just it'll blow your mind. Because this was right after he died, and so uh, I, I had to believe that he was, you know, coming to me for a reason and, and imparting some wisdom. So. I have no doubt. So have, I've got a question: Have you ever crashed a sculpture, moving it somewhere? Yes, yes, I hey. have. Um, and you know, my stuff that, that's, you know, I, I had a big show in Shanghai a few years ago, and. Uh, Back then, I was sculpting all of the works, usually out of wood, um, chainsaws and things like that. And I had a dog that lost its tail and an ankle in the shipping. You know, international shipping is brutal. And they'll use these shipping containers. And it's kind of why I like having a shipping container, because I can know exactly how big I can make something. <laughs> and it'll fit, you know, to go anywhere. Right. But... After that happened, man, I started working in fiberglass because fiberglass is great and you can create it in such a way that it usually won't 
break, even if you drop it from a great distance, um, you can create it so that it will flex and bend, um, you know, because broken crayons, I can repair immediately, but like structural damage to a real mm -hmm. sculpture, you know, like, like that is much tougher to repair. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So what you do with that sculpture? Is that just, just the end of that one? Which one? The one that in Shanghai when they had the broken pieces was that just were you able to repair it or did you can no, you no I, I was able on? to repair it we had to bring in a translator and they they had to bring in a woodworker so we could communicate about exactly what kind of wood but it was in Shanghai you know which is the most urban area like imagine Manhattan stacked on top of itself several times and you know I I needed wood to carve you know. I, and um, it was not immediately available. They had a lot of, of material, uh, but wood not so much. You know, no, no forests anywhere. It was really odd. And you didn't have your tools to work with either. No, I brought over several tools to install things, but we didn't anticipate that. And it, it changed, you know, how I, I, I think about everything now. I bet. I pack uh, just boxes for any show now to almost recreate something from scratch if I have to. But now I, I'm creating and working with shippers who are so good that I, I don't have any damage anymore. That's so awesome. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a nice, you know, uh, I guess it's a, a, a nice tool of, of getting to show enough, you know, you, you feel like you've arrived. <laughs> when when yes. things, you get to work with people who treat your work, you know, with white gloves and stuff. It's a, yeah, it's a weird feeling. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Here's what well, here's what I really love. Oh, yeah, I did a um, an install out in Las Vegas for a guy who lived in the Howard Hughes condos. It was <laughs> surreal, the amount of security that was in there, and um, t tremendously nice guy. And yeah, I would have loved to have stayed in his condo, but. Um, that he wouldn't allow that, but he did put me up at Caesar's palace across the, the way. And it took a good three or four days for us to install. It's like a nine foot cactus out of crayons for him. Right. And by the end of that, that install walking in and out of these casinos, I, I started to see sharks swimming through the crowds of people about waist level. Because, man, Vegas Vegas is a tough place, man. If you've never been, it just, whoo, I, I'm not made for Vegas, man. It, it uh, did a number on me. So I had to create a whole body of work after getting out of there uh, just to decompress. You know, it gave me a lot of stuff to think about. Because um, it's kind of a testament to what man can do, you know, not necessarily what they should do. Uh, so this is my artist wheel of fortune. <laughs> and if you zoom in on it, you'll see um, you're meant to stand on the platform, give it a big spin, and the paintbrush acts as a stopper. And it's how you kind of think your your worst critics will pan your work. You know, is he a degenerate? You know, is he going to die unknown? Um, and the only good wedge I put on it was being original. And I took the stopper off and I made it like an eighth of the size of the others because the house always wins, right? You know, that's, that's just the way things are. Wow. Well, I would say you're, I'm sorry. I don't know why I've lost my, um, let's try that again. So the presentation, yeah, it's, it's out there. It's real colorful and real satisfying to spin though, man. Um, just, dipped a brush in um, like plastic handle maker, you know, and it, it acts perfectly as a <laughs> Wonderful. It lasts That's forever. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous though. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, that's very Howard Hughesy as well. Oh man. Yeah. That place was nuts. Um, it is a nuts place. I've, I've been once and I was like, I don't know that I really ever need to go back. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vegas is, is a strange, strange, wild place, man. But yeah, it, whew, I, I had to rent a convertible and drive through like south through Mesa and, and just try to decompress after that. Yep. 
Um, okay, job. well, this was a very different period of time. You know, what was that, eight years ago? Wow. Um, yeah. Well, uh, that, you did this actually for the inauguration, did you not? Yeah, well, I, I did it when uh, Obama, I started it when he got the nomination. I finished it the day of uh, him getting like the winning the uh the the vote so i i finished it around the like, november 3rd um and it, it took a while for me to create but i was just so inspired as an artist i think we really pick up on figures who are out there speaking to uh you know what, what really touches us and man when he said you know we are more than a nation of red and blue states it got me and um I'm, I'm kind of always looking for that. You know, I, I listen. Uh, we, we all do and, and try to reflect, you know, what where we want to be or what we perceive, you know, things to be. And it was uh, it was cool. It was, it was one of my favorite presidents. And yeah, dude saw this work uh, who was organizing a big inaugural art exhibit. Uh, his name is Yossi Surgeon. Thanks, Michael. And he put together this entire group show uh, up in DC that, and I got to go to it, uh, bringing that piece to exhibit with dozens of other famous artists. Like I got to meet Shepard Ferry, got to meet Ron English, um, and go, go to an inaugural party. If you ever get the chance, like if somebody invites you or you can sneak in, do it. Because let me tell you, like I got to dance next to Tim Robbins. Um, I got to, be on stage with Moby, like spinning records. It was nuts, man. Uh, De La Soul played the, you know, the show. It was just, it was the coolest thing I'd ever been a part of. And then the inauguration the next day, man, was unreal. It was, uh, it was like Woodstock, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people on the, the green and all singing and clapping. It was unlike anything I'd ever been to, man. Glad you got to experience that. Me too, man. Yeah. It was surreal. You know, um, I wish I could take a lot of people with me and be just a fly on the wall <laughs> watching it. It was it was unreal. Um, especially like the groups, the, the, the just the big moving parts were that just giant groups of black congregations from southern churches were holding like spirituals on the green, you know, and singing and clapping and just it was one of the most moving things I've ever been a part of. It was yeah. So if you think back on this one, or when you were, what, what really inspired you to create this piece? I mean, a lot of great things were happening. There was a certain, a, there was a temperature that never existed before, but what really said, I've got to, I've got to create this. Man. Um, I think, you know, my, my parents uh, have always been political. Like my mom, was a, a writer for the Democratic Party in Montgomery, Alabama. You know, she uh, was one of the only only people you know, from our town uh, to to be doing that. It's a big a red sea down there, and it just um, I don't know, man. It's 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 tough to find inspiring things happening around you that that you want to create art about. Usually, we're all so inside of our own heads, you know, and uh, I think listening to Obama, it just, um, it moved me. And I, I wanted to capture that and portray something in a, in a way that I thought the crayons would, man, just really show off this, this style in a unique way. And it might, you know, touch other people and, and see our country in a new way. You know, you, you hope your art can convey things and you, you have this language to communicate and you just never know until you're complete, you know, when you complete a, a piece, if it, if it works or not. And, um, this one did, man, I'm, I'm just so happy with it. Yeah. It's a great piece. Thanks for doing it. All right. Then you come to Plunderland. Yeah. This was around 2008 when the recession dived. And, um, this was my first big show in Manhattan. Uh, I created an Instagram. Ah, I didn't know that. It took me months too, man. It's the hardest work 
some of the hardest work I ever did just to land a show in New York because I had to make so many trips up and kind of court a New York gallery director. Because uh, being an artist who does not live in New York, to land a New York show is it's next to impossible. Um, and anyway, he had me draw and design all these different variations of things, even after I'd gotten his his ear and his, his attention. He still was just one of the most um, discerning people I'd ever met. And uh, I really respected him and loved his stable of artists. It was a real honor for me to, to create a work. And he really helped me find exactly what it was I needed to create at that period of time. And so this is a, a room installation where the floor is kind of undulating clouds. And I did the Lucite base and this giant vine is coming up through a, like a rabbit's hole in the cloud. And on the vine, there's a golden fleece draped over it. And then this kind of sexy, deadly cat, a uh, big panther like creature that's kind of pink, but also bloodied. And it's, it's this real sexy beast that you don't know if it's going to, you know, allow you to touch your, your treasure there and take it with you, or if it's going to eat you and devour you whole. So I, I made this whole, uh, you know, art installation work about that, that period of time where it felt like our, our future, our footing was so in, unsecure and none of us knew where, you know, if it was going to fall out from under us, uh, at the ground, you know, at, at any moment, um, lots of, of this, this gallery dealer, his clients, uh, lots of them had lost their, their fortunes to the, uh, the Ponzi scheme, you know, um, and that the guy, the, who's the, the, was it Ponzi? who, who went No, to it, it was the Ponzi scheme, but it was, his name escapes me. He'll be back to me in one moment. Yeah. I'm, I'm having a, yeah, an early dementia moment. But anyway, that, that, that had just happened. And it was very real for, for the gallery owner and for me as well. Cause man, I mean, to have a show in New York at the height of the recession and all these other galleries are closing and you're worried like, man, this is brutal. You know, can, can the art world even survive this? It's very similar to what's happening now with COVID. You know, we're, I'm really curious, like all the arts organizations have been hit hard and we're just wondering, can we recover from this? Can, you know, is the ground going to fall out from, is there going to be anything underneath us? It's, it's brutal right now. And we don't know what this is going to finally play out to be. Yeah, yeah. Mystery is good in your art sometimes, but man, it's so nice when you you have you know, some things you know for certain that you can survive. Uh, but it does provide for some great art, man. Anxiety, stress, fear. Those are great motivators, too. Yeah. But like I said, if you can get out of your head and get it, get it from here to there. Absolutely. <laughs> Even as I, I, I get stuck with that sometimes. So I understand what you're saying completely. Dude, I wish you could have been a fly on the wall, like transporting that to Manhattan. I had to load it in a 26 foot, you know, diesel semi truck that I rented from Penske and driving that through the streets of Manhattan. Everything else is downhill after that. It's awesome. So this piece didn't break down at all. Oh, it totally breaks it took me three days and nights like where I brought three or four assistants and we did not sleep. We were spending the entire time installing that because it breaks down into multiple pieces, but it, it's a big piece, but it took forever to put it all together. It's, it's a serious museum installation, man. And it, it took, it took all of the three days and nights to put it all together. And we did not sleep. You know, Amazing. a museum would, would usually give you a week or two. Galleries, however, offer, you know, operate on a much quicker, you know, turntable. So. <laughs> and not a whole lot of help. Um, my other question was, and where is the sculpture now? Now it's in crates that I have to pay to store, you know, in like this room temperature, climate controlled space. Um, you know, I used it again. Uh, in a museum exhibit, I used it in the Shanghai exhibit. Uh, uh, so, 
several of my works I've sold. Some of them I keep and I will lease out to museums. Like, cause that's a, it's a fun piece, man, to have. And you need to have big, impressive pieces. If you're going to land a, a museum show, they've got a lot of space that you've got to fill. And I, I love to create really big sculptures, you know? Wow. That's, that's cool. That's, that's really cool. To, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's got this kind of technicolor vine. I put these really bright colors between the, the vines to make it almost have this digital strange feel. It was, I'm really proud of it. it it's so weird. Like I'm really proud of the, the pieces. I don't fully understand until I finish them. You know, uh, you just follow, you follow that rabbit. And, yeah. You know, you hope yeah. it will make sense when it's all done. And that one did. I'm just so lucky. That's fantastic. Let me know the next time it's installed. I would really love to see this piece. <laughs> yeah, I think the last time I installed it maybe was at the Children's Theater for the Shel Silverstein celebration thing they did, goodness, seven years ago. And I don't know, maybe I installed it in another museum show then, but I'll, I'll let you know. Well, maybe it's time to come out of hiding. It's fun. <laughs> now, uh, talk, now, now I'm talking about fun. Yeah, this was a uh, this was the most successful sculpture I ever created, and I made it to destroy itself. Um, this uh, this is out in Lubbock, Texas, at the National Ranching Heritage Museum, which is a outdoor walkable museum. They've moved this this stone ranch house in the background is from 1820. In some part of Texas, they moved all of these different examples of ranch houses to the grounds there so you can walk and check them out. That one was the first ranch house that had been destroyed by wildfire and then rebuilt with this certain way you stack stones and, and, and create a, a ranch house to survive a wildfire. And so uh, we, we decided to use that backdrop for this sculpture. Uh, they, they asked me to create a piece because they had three months where it did not get below 117. No, it didn't get below 100 degrees. It was 117 when I installed it, but it didn't get below 100 and it didn't rain for three months. And so they had these crazy wildfires everywhere. And so we we did this piece to raise awareness um, and to raise some money. They, they had an admission fee and to help, you know, a lot of the folks who'd lost their homes. But this, uh, what is it? The Texas Tech is right there next to the, uh, the museum. And this kid who just graduated from Texas Tech came and took a photograph of the place and interviewed me. And he said, I'm going to put this on my new blog. You know, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Colossal.com. And I was like, great, man, please. You know, uh, great free press is great press. And man, he got such a great shot of it because it was a little overcast that day. And um, man, it just goes to show how something can go viral if you get a strange enough picture that people can connect with and find like, wait, what is that? What's going on? And there was a story behind it. You know, this this photograph was literally they tracked it for me. The museum tracked how it spread after Colossal. It was reblogged in every country you can blog in, you know, so not North Korea. But everywhere else. Because uh, <laughs> you can't blog in North Korea. So there you go. But look at that photograph. The clouds and that sky. Yeah, they're just, crazy? It's just perfection. And the lighting is great. And I mean, it just looks like those sculptures are a part of that landscape for that scene. They just, they fit there. Yeah. It was satisfying, man. And I made the understructure out of fiberglass and painted it kind of this black ashen color so that when the crayons melted in the Texas sun, which they did, like candles, oh. um, it, it revealed this black ashen form underneath that had looked like a wildfire went through and melted the sculpture. And, uh, you know, people who didn't see a before picture were like, oh, my God, did the wildfire come through here? You know, <laughs> it, was, it was nuts. But it was, it's something else to create something. And this took... A lot of time and a lot of money to create but then to destroy it talk about cathartic man so when you say destroyed did it just sit there and finally melt and deteriorate into its own 
Oh man. Yeah. There was very little to collect with the Texas sun for three months. It was brutal. It was oh yeah. I'm but, sure. Man. Yeah. So that, that's a lot of wax, man. Imagine going to, you know, some Buddhist temple up on, you know, the Mount that's 300 years old and they've been having votive candles every day, you know, melt that. And that's what it looked like. It was nuts. <laughs> So it kind of reminds me of Burning Man, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah. This would have been have you, around that. Speaking of, have you ever done a piece for Burning Man? No, I I never have, man. I'm not. I don't know that Burning Man sounds fun, although I'm not a big fan of sand without a a body of water there. You know, <laughs> like I I was I was privy to a giant dust storm that came through Lubbock, and I that was enough. That was enough dust <laughs> and sand know. for me. That's that sealed it for you, huh? Yeah. Have you done Burning Man yet? No, and I want oh. to so bad. It looks crazy. I mean, uh -huh. if you have enough money, it could be a lot of fun. And I love crazy. <laughs> I love a lot of good crazy. I really do. It looks like good crazy. I've got some friends who have gone, and from what they can remember, you know, it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And but the. It, I also want to go for the art. I mean, those sculptures and those things that those people construct for that is just got to be amazing. And I would probably just sit and weep at all every darn one of them because I just love, I just you know it just what I do. Yeah, man, some of it's pretty compelling. Uh, we we exhibited a piece. This one street artist named Mars One did this gorgeous three uh, D printed bronze cast spear that was eight feet high uh, for Burning Man. And we, we exhibited like one of the three foot maquette versions of it. And it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And I can't imagine how beautiful it was sitting out in the desert. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's okay. We, you and I may have talked about doing this Burning Man thing. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be cool. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on. Oh, yeah, that's uh, just a, a piece I did to involve people in, uh, you know, with the Facebook profile. Um, I did this for a college campus and get all the students. I, I, social media is such a crazy thing. So I would I would tell people, you know, all right, go pose in there. Have somebody take a selfie of you. You all post it as your profile picture and then like whoever has done the same thing. So all of you have a thousand likes or a thousand friends overnight. So there's, there's an equality, you know, we set a base standard. So, you know, you don't have folks out there who feel like they have no friends. And it just, it was just ridiculous to me. I think social media is crazy and hilarious. Um, but I, I take it with a grain of salt and, and try to just poke fun at it and, and have fun with it, you know? But I, I totally love the equalizer and the, I mean, it, it fits. I mean, it's exactly what it is. You're right. You, yeah, man. You, you, you kind of create your own temperature. You create your own vibrancy. You create your own equalizing in that space. And um, this captures that. Yeah. It's, it's satisfying, man, to, to stand in front of something with that much color. And I think everybody's looking and this was, I guess when selfies started to become a big thing, and I, I just think that's hilarious, man, thinking about people, <laughs> you know, taking their own picture. And it's just funny. It's just funny to me. Because so, I can't find anybody else that'll do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pitiful, pitiful situation. It's it's so surreal, man. You can't make it up, you know? <laughs> Which is why I own two selfie sticks, not just one. Definitely. I never use them though. Oh, wait. okay. Moving on. Oh, I remember this one. Yeah, it's a big uh, tree. This when I, I learned my uh, my daughter. I've got two kids. My daughter's fourteen. My son's seventeen now. They're getting. God, I'm getting so old. But uh, when my daughter was younger, she's very musical, and I took her to music lessons. And the piano teacher came by one day. He's, he's like, uh, "Herb, do you realize your daughter has synesthesia?" I was like, uh, "Great." You know, first I was like, oh, no, <laughs> what, what, not, you know, not another child I have to worry about. And, but uh, he's like, no, it's a good thing, man. It's what like Prince and Jimi Hendrix uh, have. It's when you hear a sound and see a specific color. 
and it turned into this big rabbit hole for me to dive down. And I, I began to create series of work thinking about the animal kingdom, like the nature in itself using color to communicate in this spectrum that only the animal kingdom could see because we were too busy, you know, holding our phone and looking at our taking selfies of ourselves or whatever. And so I started exploring this idea of these bands of color, these stripes having specific meaning, you know, whether it's a bird landing on a branch or, you know, a murder of crows uh, cawing all at the same time or a deer drinking from a pool. Uh, every act of nature had a specific meaning and these colors reverberated that only they could see, and that had meaning as well. So it was really a cool way to explore the, the idea of something beautiful happening in front of us that, you know, it, if only we would take the time to pay attention and if we had that skill set or that language to, to understand. Exactly. It's a powerful piece. Yeah, it's satisfying. It's a, it's a big piece, too. <laughs> yeah, it's giant, and it broke down into several different pieces. And uh, man, just a feat of engineering to, you should see the insides of these things, man, are surreal. So how many crayons would you say are in that one? Uh, well, I, I kind of cheated on this one to where I don't usually use the, the crayons lengthways like that. I'm usually cutting down and using either the butts or the tips, like the birds are all butts and tips. But the tree itself, I cheated and used the entire length of the crayon so I can cover a lot more ground. And um, I probably used about 50 to 75,000 crayons just on the tree, you know? Amazing. And how long does it take you to create a piece like that? That took a good three months. Wow. And I'm working on other stuff at the same time, but uh, it, it's a process. Sure it is. Uh, a lot of, of structure beneath it. And then the carving, uh, even carving the crayons to fit how you want them is, it takes a minute. Sure. Ah, uh, that's a deer from the same idea, but this was so exciting because I, um, I decided to melt the crayons and I hung the deer upside down after I finished carving and painting it and created the layers by melting different layers of crayons and I had to create this unusual tool to melt them. But I love the whole idea of this ripple effect, you know, washing through the deer as the, the ripples are, you know, drinking from a little pond. And it's, oh, it's, I'm still so happy with this work. I, this, this is kind of an endless theme I can explore and, and just revisit. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. But that's about 30, 36,000 crayons that I melted to create that deer. It's a stunning piece. I mean, it truly is in every aspect and the, the colors and how you, and the, uh, the texture and the, the scenery and the, the that water, the, that puddle of water that it's drinking from. It's just, it's just, it's all there. I mean, everything is there. All the elements are there. Well, man, it's, it's so satisfying too. Like the more I create, the more I learn and Color has its own language of how it relates to itself. And it's so satisfying to learn this language. The, the more pieces I create, the more I learn what works really well together and what does not. Absolutely. You know? And yes. there are so many elements that work, that fit so well together in this piece as opposed to, you know, other things that I've done. I've done a lot of bad, bad art that I, you know, would experiment with and sometimes I'd burn but this one I'm, I'm still really, really happy with. No, it's a, it's a stunning piece. It really Thank is. You. Love it. Ah, there's, no, there's, no, an, show in, there's uh, an Eric Williams piece. Isn't that ridiculous? Yeah, I, I did a show in Shanghai and um, it was across the, the street. The museum was in the shopping district and there was a an Hermes store across the street and I had never even heard of Hermes I'd never seen a store I hadn't even heard of the brand at that point and um I thought it was like a Greek place like I could go and get Greek food or something so I was going across the street to get some lunch and this woman steps out of the Hermes store all in white and she looked so regal like she looked like an Asian lady die 
You know, you ever see people and they're so put together. You're like, whoa, who are you? Uh, she, anyway, she just took my breath away because it was just so stunning. It's just, just everything was put together like a fashionista. And then she had a diamond studded leash to a standard poodle that was cut, painted and shaved to look like a Bengal tiger. It was surreal. And I almost like my jaw dropped. I totally forgot I even had a phone or I would have filmed it because it was just so surreal. And she just walked down the block like she owned it. You know, it was it was amazing. So that it, it kind of spawned this entire exhibit of me thinking, you know, this dog was the ultimate fashion object. And I was like, well, what about why can't dogs have their own, you know, fashion sense? And uh, so it's just fun to play with, man. <laughs> I love it. And then that, that's the exhibit at the Reimer Gallery when I put together all of these different dogs in different, um, you know, different fashions. Like there's a Louis Vuitton. There's a Burberry Bulldog. Oh, I'm proud of that one. Um, there's like a Foxtooth Hound. Oh, I mean, there's some, I'm really proud of some of the patterns. There's like a Prada Pointer, you know, just fun kind of plays on words, but I love, I love playing with dogs, man, man's best friend, you know, um, and thinking of, of their own fashion choices was just hilarious, but very satisfying and a really fun show because people related to them in different ways. And especially when you'd use the tips to make furry dogs, um, it's really hard for people not to pet them. You know, I'm like, I know you want to, that's good. You should want to touch the art, but don't, I know you want to, but it's, it's good. <laughs> But please don't. Yes, but please don't touch the art. You know, I'm have a drink. Sure. Have a drink. Walk over here and have a drink. But let's not touch the art. Exactly. I mean, you buy it. You can take it home and touch it all you want. You know. <laughs> uh, but... You can hug that dog to pieces. Totally, Holy man. Um, what's his name? The lead singer of Aerosmith, uh, Steve Perry. Steve. Anyway, he was there at that exhibit, and he loved the the Louis Vuitton, the one in the middle, the white. Um, Doberman with the Louis Vuitton, the Murakami kind of style print. And um, he was he was just gaga. He was like, this would look great with one of my scarves. You know, and I was like, yeah, you should take it home, man. <laughs> it's surreal. It's, um, it's Tyler, Stephen Tyler. I just Stephen went blank. Stephen Tyler, oh, man. I'm a child of the age. I should know that. I just went blank over here. I think That's I've it. forgotten more things than I've ever learned. Well, right. Isn't it the truth? Well, wine didn't hurt or help anything. Uh, um, so good yeah, I, I came to this exhibit. I came when you had this going, and I was just, I could just walk around in there forever on that one. I loved everything about it. Uh, it's so satisfying, man. Uh, all right. Well, this is one of the, the last big exhibits I made. Um, I'm, I'm basing this on it. Oh, I've got a piece, actually. You have to see. Um, on this quote over here, uh, check this out. Can you see this? Um, okay, that's a textual, these are my textual pieces. This is a quote from Picasso. He said, bad artists copy, good artists steal, right? And I'm, I made this from you know crayons and uh, the only thing that I could shorten was the, the word Picasso. Um, but I, I love the idea of artists communicating with, with text. And I'm covering the camera. Anyway, I, I love the idea of Picasso saying that, and then Andy Warhol stole it and said, good artist copy, great artist steal. And then most recently, Banksy simply took Picasso's quote, scratched out Picasso's name and wrote Banksy. So um, I love the idea of this theft that we all do as artists, you know, what, what is original and what have we stolen from ideas to colors, to themes, to everything we do, technique and style. Uh, what have we stolen from someone else? How can you do anything that is wholly original? So it gave me the idea to steal every great work of art that was iconic, that could never travel together in a major museum piece and to recreate them in crayons. And then I dressed up like a, a, a 
cat, a black cat burglar, uh, like a cat burglar. And I dressed all in black and I even wore the, the little you know, the blind folds. I made children cry at the exhibit when I would pop out from behind a, a vase or something because I, you know, I still had the beard and dressing all in black like a traditional cat burglar um, was hilarious. And I, I acted like I'd stolen all of these, these works only to exhibit them in my own you know, space that I invited this very you know, exclusive set of people to see and show off to. And um, it was so much fun, man, because looking at all of the, the greatest works of art, you know, like Mona Lisa or uh, you know, Picasso's Mademoiselles d'Avignon or The Great Wave by uh, Hokusai. You know, I did a giant Chinese vase from the uh, fifth dynasty, from the, uh, uh, the Qiang dynasty. And it's so satisfying to see them all together in this new medium. And it, it was just ridiculous enough to, to be hilarious, but very satisfying on, on another level. And um, uh, I don't know. I, I've, had, I've had a good time kind of creating these in a scale. But you have to do them. Like this original woodblock print is only like 20 inches wide. I had to make that. 60 inches square to even so you can even tell what it was and even then i had to edit a little like i couldn't make the boats that are going up the waves that the you see the fishermen who are are in the storm you know at sea i couldn't even create them because you wouldn't be able to tell what they were um it would be too busy and you know i that was the smallest i could make it in crayon so that you could tell what it was that's amazing. That's amazing. So how many of those pieces did you do? For that I, I did a clean, I think I did a dozen sculptural works, and then I did another uh, half dozen or so paintings, like uh, graffiti paintings of, you know, uh, David uh, or Venus de Milo. Um, you know, oh, man, did I, I yeah. close the thing on you? There you go. But, um, yeah, I did. I did a, a few for that show, and I'm I'm still pretty proud of it. It's some of them held up really well. Yeah, cool. Moving on. Oh, okay. This is uh, the most recent public art commission. It's my first big public art commission. I just finished for the Smith Springs Community Center. Oh yeah, and sure. It's um it's suspended from the ceiling, and I'm I'm calling it Sky Lake. And it's over a hundred pieces of cut acrylic, like they had to be laser cut. And some of them are three inches thick, man. It is heavy. But I, I had to interview and train to become this public artist to get the grant from the city. And being a, a public artist is very different from being a private artist in your own studio. And I, I had to learn a lot about how to approach it, uh, how to create it and how to interact with the, the public to create something that really they were as happy with as, as I was. And um, it, it's a big learning curve, man. And it is not for the timid because the, the government process, you have to be very patient to work with, with government. It can really pay off if you win, but it's, it's a small group of artists you're competing with on a big, big scale. But it uh, was one of the most satisfying things I've ever created. I had to work with a structural engineer to get the weight and dimensions and everything right so that it had to be perfect. I had to work with architects who are unflinching. You know, um, it is their way or not at all. And, uh, you know, uh, so it, it was a big learning curve. And I, um, I learned a lot, but uh, I'm really happy the, the final result is the shape of like a lake suspended from the ceiling. If you look at it from a few different angles, uh, you know, without the, the ground to hold it all together. Cause after interviewing as many people as I could in the community, I found that, that the, the lake itself was what they were most proud of. And the, I made the elements of the lake are all pieces of the history and stories uh, from the community. Uh, different ideas like my favorite 
uh, element in that lake is there's a double tornado that um, this huge tornado hit the Smith Lake in 76 and then it hit the lake and it split in two. So uh, just you, you can't, you know, truth is always stranger than fiction. And those stories are incredible. It's a beautiful piece. And you're right. <laughs> Working through those processes is a challenge. Yes. Um, uh, yes, it is. But you're right. It can be very rewarding. Um, and you've also, then you've got a piece that's, that's going to be there for, for the public to enjoy and see for a long time. Yeah, it's a whole in different arena, man, to, to compete so and to play with. What materials are, of course, you're not using crayons. What materials are you, are you using on this one? Right. In, in the Sky Lake, those are cut pieces of pigmented acrylic. And I had to find a company that created those. There was only one, and they were in Utah. Because you can get plexiglass almost anywhere, but only in about six different colors. And I needed all the shades of blues and greens, you know, to really convey the complexity and the depth of the, the water and, uh, man, and the thickness and to, to have something like, I wanted something that the community would be proud of, like, like a suspended sapphire, like a jewel hanging from the ceiling, like this chandelier that was surreal and told all of their stories that they could all be happy with, you know, and, and marvel at and, and keep for ages. And so, uh, you know, you, I spent almost all the money I earned, you know, I, I wanted to give them their money's <laughs> worth because I knew that if I could land this, if I could do this public project, well, it, it's what I've worked my entire career to land because in, by doing it, it opens up a door to more opportunity. And the, the next slide, I'll hopefully show you like what, what I'm on to now, it, it, it enabled me to, to win the Atlanta Airport Commission, um, where I, I competed, I, I don't know how many artists I competed against, but winning it is the biggest thing that, that has ever happened to me, because I'm going to be creating six large sculptures to go up the uh, Concourse D in, in the Atlanta Airport on six giant granite um, you know, kind of shelf-like pedestals going up the uh, escalator to the left. So I treated the, the black granite almost as though it were a cascading waterfall that these animals, you know, my, my animals with the colors uh, are kind of swimming across it as though it's this body of water that they're giving safe passage to other creatures. And, um, you know, I love the, the idea that you know, small children who've never flown before could hopefully be comforted, you know, in the, the idea that these animals are embarking on this dangerous journey, you know, as well. And they're, they're they hopefully you know, can find some some comfort in it. And um, it's just so satisfying, man, to contrast, you know, what the animal kingdom is doing and how we, you know, we could do it. Uh, we're, we're doing something similar uh, all the time. But uh, I get to play with synesthesia and stuff. So those are the sketches that landed me the commission. And um, you can see right now in my studio, I've just finished the, let's see. Okay, this is the first painting, yeah, of, um, I'm doing a, like a large scale painting of the, the turtle carrying the, the Arctic fox across the, the body of water. And um, like the black granite is the body of water. And you can see where I'm breaking down into using like the butts or the tips in the, the fox to make it look furry or not. And I'm playing with the idea of synesthesia in the shell of the turtle and the ears of the, the fox as though they're perceiving things we can't. And then I'm playing with uh, the idea of climate change and rising sea levels as though um, like in the the turtle here has got watermarks on his body where um, he's like survived the, the top one being the, the, like the glacial melt. And then this is supposed to represent like the wildfires out in uh, the, the West coast with the red and then the black from this oil spill that he saved the, the Fox from. So, you know, man-made disasters in our own plight and humanity. And um, so I've got to make a large painting 
before I create the, the giant sculpture. And so this is really what I'm working on in the studio. You can see this is going to be the, uh, the narwhals that are suspending a big three-toed sloth between them that they've, uh, they're going to help him, I guess, across the, <laughs> the body of water as well. I don't, I don't know. I was having a lot of fun um, kind of, you know, playing with different animals and, and what they could all do together. But that's, that's where I am. So I'm, I'm uh, in this stage of, of making bigger paintings before I create the bigger sculptures out of crayons. That's amazing. <clears throat> but y'all can come down anytime. I've, I've got a studio here, just mask up and we'll all socially, you know, distance around the deck and stuff. I can catch you up on, on what I'm working on. Sure. I want to come over. We're going to sit outside and just have us a few brewskis. Dude, it's like an oasis here. I mean, they're still playing volleyball. It's nuts. <laughs> it's, it's like this big sign from above that I need to get in shape. And this might be the year I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Herb, it's been an absolute delight to spend time with you this evening. I could not ask for a better person to spend my evening with. Well, thank you, Glenn. I'm, I'm going to consider it date night. That's what I'm going to start with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great night for it great night for it uh so everyone thank you so much for joining us this is community arts of bellevue uh if you would like uh, uh you can learn more from us from caofb.org uh, is our website address and you're always welcome to um there's also a way that you can contact me through the website if you have questions or like no more information uh, look up Herb Williams on his website as well. Uh, I think it is what herbwilliams.com. Is it herbwilliamsart.com? Herbwilliamsart.com. Uh, please look into Herb. He is a he's a Nashville treasure, um, and we're just lucky to have him. And um, I think that's all I have for us this evening. Herb, would you have anything else you'd like to say with the, to the? I'm good. Thanks so audience? much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. It's a great crowd to be uh, associated with, man. Yeah. This is awesome. We are great. Thank you. Uh, so to all of you, have a great evening. Uh, tomorrow's Friday. Yay! It's about, dang, about dang time. So uh, I hope you all have a great evening, and we'll see you soon next Thursday, if nothing else. All right. Thanks so much, Glenn. Thank uh, you, Herb. Bye-bye.